Today, we are going to talk about magnetic fields of coils. In the lab, we are going to measure the magnetic field due to a current carrying coil. Using a magnetic field sensor and a rotary motion sensor, we will be able to observe what the magnetic field looks like as a function of x, or the position along the center axis of the coil. Before we get into the experiment, let's determine what the magnetic field should look like along the perpendicular axis through the center of the coil. Now, we see that the field should look like the equation 1, or b equals mu naught n i r squared over 2 quantity x squared plus r squared to the 3 halves. But let's prove it. All right, so in order to solve for the B field from one of these current carrying rings, we are going to need to use the Biot-Savar law. Now, Biot-Savar's law tells us that our B field equation, or at least a small chunk of the B field, should be given like so. You'll notice I have mu naught i over 4 pi, and then, of course, a cross product between dl and r minus r prime over the magnitude of r minus r prime uh, cubed. Okay, so let's t first talk about what dl is. Well, dl is simply a small little chunk of our current carrying loop. Okay, it's just a small arc length of that loop, and that's what we're going to be kind of exploiting in a little bit here, okay? Now r minus r prime uh, are two vectors. r is the first vector I want to talk about, and the first vector that I'm interested in is the vector that points from our origin out to some position that I'm interested in, okay? And we can imagine our loop being centered right around uh, the the origin here, and this first vector that I drew will describe my r vector. r points from the origin to the point that I'm interested in. So let's say I wanted to know the b field, you know, out here. That's where my r vector would point. Okay, the next vector, which is the r prime vector, points again from the origin, but it points towards some current carrying element and I'm going to describe that by r prime. So, so let's just look at the small little current element up top. So some small little chunk of the current element up there. And I now have these two vectors. When I subtract these two vectors, I get a third vector, right? By simply doing some vector addition or vector subtraction, if you will, uh, we end up with a third vector that looks like this, this gold vector here, okay? This I'm going to name script R, okay? That's what we're going to name that for simplicity's sake. So now we have this script R that points from a small little chunk of current carrying wire to our observation point. You'll notice I've rewritten the BIOS of our law down here with the script R. Now, with this script R, I should be able to simplify the equation further. My script R can be described by the magnitude of the script R and the direction of the script R, or R hat. By doing this, I can cancel out one of those magnitudes down in my denominator, right? If I take out my magnitude up top here, I can cancel it with one of those magnitudes down below. And I end up with this equation here. So now I have mu naught over 4 pi times i dl cross r hat over the magnitude of r squared. How can we describe the magnitude of r? Well, r is simply a vector that points from our ring to the point that we're interested in on some axes. So let's say we're looking along the x-axis. 
how could we describe the magnitude of this script r vector? Well, we could use Pythagorean's theorem. In order to use Pythagorean's theorem, we need to know the two side lengths. Well, this side length from the origin to this point on the x-axis can simply be described by x. All right, how about the other side length? The one pointing from the origin to some point on our ring. Well, that's going to be described by r, the radius of the ring. Using this relationship, I can describe my magnitude of r as the square root of r squared plus x squared. And this is equal to magnitude of r. All right. So I, I've done that down below here. You'll notice one of my squares or, or the square went away because I have the square root of r squared plus x squared. Uh, and that was squared, so that went away. All right, so now I have this equation here. The next thing I want to get rid of, or at least modify, is the cross product that we're looking at right here. The dl cross r is not necessarily what we want to be looking at, so let's see how we can modify that. Well, in order to modify that, let's think of cross products the way we think of all cross products. And we turn it into this uh, simple equation where we take the two magnitudes of the vectors and multiply them by sine theta. Okay, now the magnitude of r hat is 1, so we're not even going to worry about that. But we still have dl and sine theta. And of course, cross products always result in a vector. So I've left a little question mark there for what direction is my vector pointing in. Okay, so let's take this idea and we'll run with it. What is the angle between dl and r hat? Well, let's come up to my picture up here. And we'll notice that we have a dl coming out of our page. And it's a little bit tough to draw this, folks. But I do have a dl coming out of my page. And of course, my r vector points from that point down to where I'm interested. So now I need to do a cross product between dl and r. So you guys are going to want to use your right hand and try and follow along with me here. Okay, so whip your right hand out. We need to point our fingers or a finger in the direction of dl, which is straight out of the page here, or out of your screen if you're watching. When we cross it with r, we curl our fingers, or finger, in the direction of our vector. Your thumb will point in the direction of the resulting b field. Okay, and look, you should be in agreement that your b field should be pointing up at some angle, I haven't done a perfect job of describing the angle because, you know, this should look a little bit closer to, to 90 degrees, but uh, hopefully your thumb is pointing in that direction. And one thing we do want to see is that DL cross R here is always going to be a 90 degree angle between these two vectors here, okay? Uh, DL is coming out of our page. Our R vector is stuck in the page, in the plane of the page. So those will always be orthogonal. We will always be evaluating sine of 90 degrees. So that sine function will in fact just go to one. Now, if we look at the direction of our B field, you'll notice it's kind of off uh, at some angle. Right? It's not pointing directly along the X axis. It's pointing up a little ways. So let's entertain ourselves here. Well, let's look at the bottom part of the, of the ring. What's going to happen with the bottom part of the ring if we do the same exercise? Well, our current is going into the page in the bottom. If we curl our fingers then in the direction of the R vector, our resulting B field should be coming down. 
and let me just move this out of the way real quick. But our resulting B field should be coming down at an angle like so. And again, this is a DB, some small little chunk, right, from a small current element. We haven't done the whole thing yet. But notice what's happening here. The very top and the very bottom part seem to have some cancellation, right? They both have components in the X direction, but they cancel their other components, okay? So one thing we need to recognize here and then use to our advantage is that we can recognize that there's going to be some great symmetry here and we can we can um, eventually say that, hey, I know all these other components are going to cancel except for my x direction components. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to say I only am interested in the x directional component of db. In order to get that, I'm going to look at the sine, or sorry, I'm going to look at the cosine of this angle phi. Okay, and that's how I'm going to get the portion that's in the x direction. So I'm going to multiply db by cosine of phi, and I'm going to end up with something rather nice in the end. Well, we need to go through a tiny bit of trigonometry here uh, before we get to that result. So notice that this angle phi plus 90 plus some other angle gamma will in fact add up to 180 degrees because it's right a straight line. Okay, and because of that, we can see pretty clearly here that this angle up here is also described by phi. How convenient. Well, folks, since we are looking at db cosine phi, we need to think of a way to express this angle here. Well, we can use some simple trig and we can see that the cosine of phi is going to give us the adjacent, which is of course this component right there, over the hypotenuse, which is of course this component right here. And we're going to end up with something that looks like this, db equals r, which was our adjacent component, over square root of r squared plus x squared, which is our hypotenuse component. Fantastic. So let's come back down to the equation we were analyzing a little bit ago. Right, and we've said, we've said now that we are only really interested in the components that point in the x hat direction. So that's why we've multiplied by cosine phi. Now we can describe cosine phi using this equation right here. That's what we just found. So now we have this new expression for db. The next logical step is to do an integral. Right? That's all we have left to do. So let's pull all of our constants out. So we now have db equals right, all of our constants, mu naught i r over 4 pi uh, r squared plus x squared to the 3 halves. And the only thing that we need to integrate over is the dl, or the arc length of the whole ring, right? And basically just the circumference of the ring. So I've defined a new angle here, a new alpha. You, you know, I'm taking, I'm showing this process in completion. You might already recognize that this is just the circumference of the ring. And you can just make the jump and say, oh, this should be r times 2 pi, or 2 pi r, circumference of a ring. But if you want to be explicit about it, then we should define some angle. I've defined it d alpha, right? And, and you can see in my picture here what's going on. I'm defining dl as r d alpha because it is an arc length. So my arc length can be described as r d alpha. I will integrate d alpha from 0 to 2 pi, and I'll end up with uh, just r times 2 pi. So at the very end, you'll notice I've taken the liberty of adding an n there, but we'll talk about that in a second. So 
at the very end, we should have this equation right here. Mu naught i r squared, 2 pi over 4 pi r squared plus x squared to the 3 halves. Okay, obviously there's some stuff I can cancel here. I can get rid of uh, the pi's. Those will cancel out. And I can also cancel this 2 with some of that 4, and I'll end up with something that looks a little bit like that. The last thing we need to do here is add the n, right? We are dealing with a ring that's built of multiple uh, multiple current carrying rings. So they're all basically superimposed on each other. Now, if this is the B field from one ring and we have n number of rings, all we need to do is multiply this equation by n and we have solved for the B field for all those rings. Fantastic. So this is what our B field equation should look like. Now let's start, start talking about uh, what we're going to do with it. All right. Now that we've solved for the B field of a single ring or a single coil, we can use that to our advantage. So hopefully everybody recognizes and agrees with the statement that we have here for equation one. This is the B field that we found. So we're going to take experimental data that will back that equation up. Later on, we will be moving on to using two coils. So we'll have two separate coils set up on our track, and hopefully our B field equation can be adapted to uh, observe that, okay? So luckily for us, you know, the ad adaptation is pretty straightforward. All we need to do is add B1 and B2 together for the two separate rings. Uh, so you'll see here that is what we have done. We have one ring that is, you know, positively uh, moved, adjusted away from x, one that is negatively adjusted away from x, and we've adapted the two equations uh, to follow that setup, right? Distance d is the total distance separa uh, separation, and, di and the distance between one of these coils and x is either going to be described by d over 2 minus x, or d over 2 plus x, okay? And that's how we're describing those two different uh, B field equations from the two different coils, all right? So that's how we're going to describe those, and we'll be using that a little bit later. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to adjust the separation of those two coils so that we have a specific distance between them. And this is called a Helmholtz separation, okay? So when we separate these coils, when we adjust D until D is equal to R, which is the radius of those coils, the coils should give a uniform magnetic field between the coils, okay? So, so when we adjust D to equal R, we should have a uniform magnetic field between those two coils. So if those two coils are uh, adjusted to that distance, we should be able to observe this equation three here uh, between those coils. So let's jump back up to equation two and kind of convince ourselves that that will be the case. If we put r over two in here, and we put r over 2 in there, and we adjust x to be 0. Sorry. We adjust x to be 0 for both of these. Then we should see that we'll have some nice uh, common denominators down there, and we should end up with an equation that looks exactly like this. All right. After that part, we will move on to a solenoid experiment here. And the solenoid's B field goes as mu naught n times i, where n is the number of coils, or the number of turns, as it's sometimes stated. And i is the current. All right, so that's, that's the last part, the solenoid part. So let's move on to the setup. All right, so I will give a brief description of our setup here, and then uh, you guys should be prepared to start the lab.
So during our setup phase, I'm just going to describe what is set up here and then we can talk about uh, what you guys are going to be doing a little bit. So as depicted here, they tell us that we do have a Helmholtz coil. So that is this big, large coil here. Uh, you can see the copper wire uh, spun around that loop. Another thing to pay attention to is that we do have this magnetosensitive probe here. So that's what's sticking out the front there. Uh, this is on a track, so we can move this probe down the track or back up the track, and we can record what the B field uh, observed is at various points along this track here. Okay, so that's what we're doing with the with the probe there. We're moving it down the track uh, and observing what the B-field looks like as a function of position. You'll notice that we do have a power supply set up over here, so that's what this is. Uh, ours will look a little bit different than that probably, but that's fine. The other thing they have set up down here is an ammeter that is simply measuring the current through the Helmholtz coil, which we will need. And the last thing I want to point out is this data acquisition software here. We'll have something similar and we'll be able to uh, take the data uh, and record it in some software. So you'll notice down at the last step of the setup phase, they have Open Data Studio Program called MagField Coils. Uh, and that is where the data will be sent uh, and we'll be able to analyze it in that program on your computer. Okay, so those are already installed on the uh, computers in the lab. Uh, so we'll be using that to uh, to collect our data. Alright, so, so the setup is going to be uh, pretty straightforward here. Uh, you may need to adjust the height of these feet uh, so that your probe will move in and out or up and down the track here. Um, but basically we'll get to that when we get to that. Uh, I hope everybody has a a, at least a semi-thorough understanding of what we will be doing. These are two Helmholtz coils um, and we have a ruler over here and this is our magnetic field sensor. Uh, what we want to do is we want this magnetic field sensor to ride through this Helmholtz coil. Right now we are only connected to this coil and this coil is not connected. So just disregard the presence of this coil here, the first one, closer to the magnetic field sensor. Um, what we want to do here is to move this uh, along, the same, uh, along a straight line through this, this uh, coil and record the uh, magnetic field um, in the, using the software, which is Pascal. Um, we also have a rotary motion sensor here because as we move, we want to know how far we moved and we have this weight which keeps this wire taut and as we move this so as we move this there's a pulley which keeps rotating and that's how this motor registers how much we have moved. So now we've connected both of these coils in series, you can see we've got the cable coming over here so that the field is going in the same direction on both of the coils. What separation are they at? I think it's written there, right? Uh, yeah, these are at 10 centimeters separated. Right. 